All right, thanks for coming, everybody. I uh, hope you're having a, a great time at uh, APU 13. Uh, my name's Gordon Sally. I'm here to talk about uh, GPU per Studio 2. There's a little bit about me. Uh, I've been at AMD six or seven years now. But before that, I've worked in uh, special effects, movies, uh, games, etc. So I've seen a lot of developments. And I um, want to bring some of the uh, skills to bear in the presentation today. This is what I want to do. I want to do a quick introduction of Perth Studio 2, explain to you what it is and what it does, and more importantly, who uses it. Um, and then I want to talk about how you use Perth Studio 2 in practice. Um, you know, with these kind of presentations, you usually get up and do a tech demo and show an SDK sample running, um, but you never really get a feel for how it's used in the field by real game engineers. And over the last couple of years, I've been able to get out and spend time at some studios and really investigate you know, how people are using the tool. And it was a real eye-opener for me. And hopefully it'll be um, interesting for you guys to, to hear what I have to say about that. So I actually want to do uh, three case studies, um, how it was used on Assassin's Creed 3, in particular how they used it to understand the frame, um, how it was used on Far Cry 3, and how you can use automated data mining, which is a sort of feature of our tool, to find uh, locate assets in your game where you may not necessarily know where they are in the game, if that makes any sense. Hopefully it will later. And then I want to talk a little bit about the work that Valve have been doing using our tool to port the Source 2 engine to OpenGL on Linux. Then talk a little bit more about um, what's new, um, up and coming for Perth Studio in terms of Mantle and Linux support. So what is it? It's a suite of tools that could be used to debug and optimize graphics applications for AMD hardware. It's actually a suite of tools that consists of a frame profiler, a frame debugger, an API trace, and a shader debugger. It's a client-server model, so you can run the client-server on one machine for development mode, and if you want really accurate profiling, you can run your application on a server and attach to it over a network from a client. And uh, <coughs> I have some slides on that later. It supports 32 and 64-bit applications, DX11, DX10, up to OpenGL 4.2 applications at the moment. There's no special build required for your application. You don't need to integrate per studio with our tool. You just drag your executable onto our executable, and you're up and running. It's a small footprint, so there's no installation. You can run it anywhere. And it's a free download from developeramd.com. So here's a screenshot of the frame debugger. I'll actually be doing some demos of games uh, in a minute, but I want to you know, spend some time to explain some of the key components I'll be showing. The frame uh, debugger is really um, a tool that allows you to capture and play back and view um, the contents of your frame. It's got a draw call slider area at the bottom here with GPU times measured by these height values, which easily you know, lets you see what is you know, some of the most expensive draw calls in your frame. You can inspect the resources at each of the uh, stages of the graphics pipeline, your input assembler, vertex shader, pixel shader, and so on. And you can view all of the game resources uh, that are bound to your shader, as long as you haven't stripped them, of course. Sly glances across the room there. And you can view and edit your shader code. Um, if you de use debug shaders, um, you will see HLSL. And if not, you just see the assembly. Over on the right-hand side, we can see sampler information and um, the uh, render state information. And we can see the uh, geometry that we're rendering down here. And we've got our constant buffers here. So basically, look at the stage in your pipeline that you're interested in, see all the resources bound to the, um, each of the draw calls at that stage. The frame profiler really is a table of results. Um, but it kind of works at different levels. We've got profiling in the frame uh, debugger, where you see the height values for each of the draw calls. And then you've got the stage-specific values, the uh, counters that you can view. So you can see how expensive each of your draw calls is at each of the pipeline stages. And then there's a third level where you can go into each of the pipeline stages and get lower level counters to find out what might be going on, say, in your pixel shader. So a three-level approach there. Uh, shader debugger and editor. Uh, this is quite a powerful tool. This allows you to edit live HLSL and G GLSL code inside your app while it's running inside the tool. 
and compile it and insert it back into the game. So you can make micro changes to your shader code um, and see the effects in game. You can debug live HLSL and assembly code inside the app when running in the tool. So you can actually step through your shader code uh, instruction by instruction and inspect all of the register values for all of the pixels at the same time, uh, or in step rather. You can do the normal things that you can do with a uh, debugger, insert, breakpoints, run to, step over, etc. And one of the useful things about this tool in particular is that you can take a profile before editing your shader, take another profile after editing your shader and see the delta and compare the uh, performance uh, implications of the changes you've just made. So it's a pretty good tool for tracking down rendering issues. You know, your shader's doing something that you don't, don't want it to or it's not performing the way that you want. You can vi visually go in and inspect it and you can also inspect it from a performance point of view. The API trace, um, it's more of a CPU side um, tool. It's a list of all of your API calls, not just your draw calls. And it has uh, arguments, so you've got your pointer values. It's got CPU timeline information along here at the top. So you can see um, length and duration of each of your API calls. It supports multi-threaded uh, API usage. So here we can see we've got a tab for each of the threads that are in flight. And we see here DX11 deferred contexts and all of the API calls under each of those um, command lists that are being generated. So I'll show how that's been used um, <coughs> some of the games a little bit later. So uh, remote debugging, as I mentioned, this allows you to run your game in foreground mode. Um, so it gets uh, you know, most of the priority of the CPU and GPU. And you've got your client .NET client running on uh, another machine, running over the network, and extracting the data from your game running. This is the best way to get you know, good, um, accurate profiling information. But you can run both on a single machine. I'm running it on an old 5000 series laptop here. Um, it runs on all of AMD's hardware. Um, so this is great for general development mode. So who uses it? Our AMD developer technology engineers, uh, they use it to optimize and debug game titles in conjunction with developers. These are people going to games companies and integrate AMD uh, rendering technology into games. AMD driver performance team, these are the people that improve GPU benchmarks and titles at the driver level. And we, our own in driver team internally, use it to inspect apps that can cause driver related issues, so rendering bugs, etc. And AMD's compute team, game compute team. These are the people that bring you the uh, tech demos that you see below here. And I think we're working on a new Ruby demo right now, so that should be out soon. And most importantly, the external users. So these are the graphics developers, people doing DX11, OpenGL, and you know, soon to be Mantle um, applications. So yeah, tools for games. There's no one fit all solution for tools usage in game development. Developers use tools from multiple vendors and we encourage that. Typically, if you want to target specific GPU hardware and get profiling information, you're going to have to use that vendor's tools to get that data. Developers use internally developed tools in conjunction with vendors' tools. And quite often they won't tell you what they are. But we provide GPU Perf API, which is our low level library that allows you to get counter values from uh, AMD GPUs. And in fact, Per Studio is built on top of that library. You can download that library now, the very same one that we're using in our tool, to integrate into your own tools if you wish. It runs on Linux and Windows. Tool requirements vary during the development of life cycle of a game. At the beginning, you may be more concerned with frame structure, um, how your threads are doing in flight, how your frame is actually being formed. And later on, you know, follow up with performance inquiries as to you know, performance issues in your game. Drivers, graphics APIs, hardware changes make tools development a constantly moving target. And it's difficult to make sure that tools work with all applications. And I think every vendor you know, has those issues. Two really nice quotes from GDC. Um, GPU tools are special flowers which is probably the nicest way that you can describe GPU tools, referring to the sort of round robin nature of getting a build of your game and loading it up with all of you know, our tools, other people's tools, 
which ones work, which components within those tools work, and what information can we get from those. And that can be a frustrating experience. Um, and there's a tendency for developers to not tell us that they work. And if they do work, there's a tendency to tell us or not tell us that they're working either. So getting feedback is important, but quite often, due to the frustrations and time constraints to game development, we don't get the feedback that you know, we'd like. So it's great when I can actually get out there and get some of that information. However, used effectively, tools can lead to a pot of gold. So you can save yourself a lot of development time if you can, say, invest a day or a half day or a couple of days getting tools to work with your application. Save you having to roll your own. And you may get to answer the question um, that you're seeking to answer a lot more quickly if you use a vendor tool. And I want to talk about Val's experience of that to give you some hope that that is actually a reality. So today I want to talk about some of the typical uses of Perth Studio that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, transitioning from a forward to a deferred render, this is a common theme that we see. And the types of things that people want to do in that is inspect render targets in detail to look for you know, rendering issues and debug and profile the resolve shader, which is probably the most you know, expensive shader in the game for a deferred renderer. Locating and debugging a shader within a game, this is actually quite difficult. If you've got a you know, complicated shader compilation process, you've got snippets of HLSL code, you actually don't know where they end up in the scene. Um, we'll show you a way in which you can locate those using Per Studio. Detecting expensive draw calls, you want to do this quickly, visually, and understand the issue as quickly as you can. You want to profile individual assets within a game, so you can use perf markers to block around a character or a main element in your game. You want GPU times for that asset, not just the individual draw calls, particularly when you're budgeting in-game. You may be multi-threading a single context. We're seeing a lot more of this right now. The sort of effect of console games typically uh, uses many, many threads, and we're seeing that play out in the PC space right now. And you may want to port OpenGL games uh, from Windows to Linux. So these are some of the common things that we've seen, particularly in these three titles. So I want to take a look at some of the scenarios um, where Per Studio was used with these. They're a little older now, um, you know, a couple of years old, well, a year old, really. But the work's been done over the last 18 months to two years. So the first thing I want to start off is how Ubisoft used uh, Perf Studio to understand the frame in AC3. So what I want to do here is paint a little bit of picture of the kind of scale of the work that they were doing. Um, it was based on the previous Anvil and Scimitar engines. Same engine lineage as the AC games that came before it. But it's the first AC game to use deferred rendering. So you can imagine you've got a, a bunch of engineers who are having to retool the renderer completely different way. Plus, it's the first DX scimitar title. So you can imagine, perhaps, the scenario at that studio uh, trying to get the graphics team up to speed in that area. Plus, they're trying to engineer new rendering effects, volumetric mist, falling snow, rain, surface wetness, snow, deformable snow, many NPCs in the game, new lighting techniques, new ambient occlusion models, ocean simulation, and um, uh, you know, uh, multi-sample ambient occlusion. So a lot going on at any one particular time, and you're, you're trying to create a tool that can help in all of these areas. So they had five graphics programmers. All of them used the tool. One of the things they liked was the quick startup of the tool with the app. It's a fast edit cycle. There's no sort of when you do a frame capture, there's no rolling it off the disk, having I mean, to process the uh, data on disk afterwards. It's live in game. So um, the ability to start the game up you know, quickly is a value. They used it for cross-platform development. And most of their work was done in the frame debugger to understand the frame structure. And you can imagine how that's important as you move from a forward renderer to a deferred renderer, and then to identify the slow draw calls and optimize the shader. So simple work, really. And then the profiler was used towards the end of the development cycle. One of the things that they valued was the stability of the tool. And for most of their time, um, Perth Studio seemed to work well for them in that sort of edit development cycle, um, which is great. It doesn't you know, happen all the time, but in this case, it worked particularly well. So I want to do a, a little bit of a demo um, using a, a, quite an old build of um, 
AC3 right now. It's a demo, so it's guaranteed to have a little, maybe some crashes, we'll see. It's actually getting harder and harder to keep some of these older builds alive as the OS and drivers and everything changes. So here we see uh, a scene uh, from the game. What I did there is I just dragged AC3 onto the Perth Studio server, which injects a DLL into the game. It basically turns it into a web server. What I do now is just start the client up and connect to that web server. Here we can see all the processes that are running. Um, we can see a DX9, DX10, and DX11 devices loaded. We could actually go and attach to any of those, but we're interested in DX11, which is the main rendering. First thing we want to do is pause the frame, so we'll click pause. And we're doing a frame capture here. So we've, what we've done there is record all of the API calls as objects within our server, and we're now playing those back from inside the Perth Studio server. We can't interact with the game anymore. We've frozen time. So what we can do now is our three tools are available, our frame debugger, our frame profiler, and our API trace. Let's take a look at the frame debugger. So we've foregrounded the application and a little profile is going on. Um, so we foregrounded it so it's getting a little bit more CPU uh, priority. We're taking a, that profile of all the draw calls. <clears throat> and we're pulling that data back to the client. And there we have it. And here you can see quite clearly the uh, resolve shader standing out like a sore thumb there. But of course, amortized over all of the uh, draw calls in the scene, it's quite acceptable. So what we have here, um, this is the stage selector here. We can click on the input assembly, and we can see the uh, individual um, indices and vertex buffers. But obviously, we're doing a quad here, so there's not much to look at there. But if we looked at a different draw call, we could see that, that data there and get some idea of the uh, index buffer reuse. We can see that these two are highlighted. So that might help with caching if you can see uh, your index buffer. We can look at the vertex shader. We could actually debug the vertex shader and step through that. I'm not going to do that right now. And of course, we've got our pixel shader here. So let's take a look at the resolve shader. Here we can clearly see the um, textures that are bound. We've got our color buffer. And we can double click on that and open that up in our texture viewer. We can view that in data mode if we wish. These are actually the DDS uh, data files that are coming back from the driver so they're as accurate um, as what's actually used on the GPU. We've got our normal buffer here. We've got our depth buffer, etc., And we can see our shader code. We can see the sample instructions, flow control, etc. <clears throat> 657 uh, Microsoft Assembly instructions here. Over on the right-hand side, we've got our render state, as I pointed out earlier. Let's take a look now at the API trace. Here we can see that the uh, game is ni nicely annotated with uh, perf markers. So you can sprinkle this, these around your code to um, create sections of perf marker code, um, which will show up in most diagnostic tools. And I'll just want to point out the end over here. We've got our screen space ambient occlusion over here. So we can zoom in, see how the frame is made up. We can see where the command lists are generated and executed here. You can zoom in, see those calls. Now, one of the things um, that I wanted to point out here is we're showing a single threaded mode here. Um, what we can do is we can turn flattening off, play the game again. So the game's now running. Do another capture.
and with flattening off we can actually see the execution of the command lists here. We can see that we've got considerably fewer draw calls and each of these execute command lists, you can now see where that's uh, being used in the frame. And if I open up the API trace again, we can see the threaded version. So you can see how the tool was useful when uh, they were using or, or wanted to integrate uh, command lists in DX11. Um, we can clearly see uh, the threads in action here. So uh, that, that could be pretty useful in that case. The other thing that is useful is the navigation using the perf markers. Let's t go back to the uh, screen-based ambient occlusion. So I just want to show you how relatively easy, easy, relatively easy it is to locate, you know, sort of effects if you use perf markers in your game. Here we can clearly see the section um, for the screen-based ambient occlusion. If we look up here, just above it, we can get a glimpse of the uh, rendering before the ambient occlusion is applied. And here we can see the two blur stages. So I'll just click on that. And here we can see the texture that's bound. And we can see that this is the un unfiltered occlusion. Go to the next draw call. And we can see we've got a lateral blur, horizontal blur has been applied here. We can see the shader code that has applied that blur. We see the sample instructions in blue. And we do that again down here to do the vertical blur. And here we see the nicely blurred ambient occlusion. Um, so why am I pointing that out? Well, when you're generating effects, it's really nice to be able to see the, the effect uh, as it builds up associating your textures with your shader code, being able to see quite clearly the rendering anomalies if there are any uh, in your render targets. So, you know, fairly useful. Um, I took a couple of screenshots before and after, um, just so you can see the ambient occlusion being applied. So that's before and that's after. So how did I do that? What we can do is if you click on any of your textures, you can right click and save the image out. So you can save these textures out to disk for your before and after comparison. That's how I did that. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how useful the tool is um, in this particular context. Of course, the usage of tools in game developers is different for every game developer and at different times of the, uh, you know, the development cycle. So I'm going to close that demo down now. Start the next one up. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the data mining feature, um, particularly how it was used in Far Cry. So this was developed uh, using the Dunia 2 engine, the original engine for Far Cry 2. And again, similarly, this was switched to a deferred render in the middle of uh, development. Two out of the 10 programmers used per Studio 2. Two programmers developed for console, and the main optimization was for Xbox and PS3 and then later optimized for the PC. So, the, again, they were you know, pretty um, forward-looking in the kind of effects that they wanted to support. So this is just a little sort of background to that. There's a before and after for MSAA. They had a GPU-like culling system in the game. SSTRs, real-time global illumination. And they tried direct compute accelerated ambient occlusion, but I don't think that made it into the game. I think they went back to the PS. Advanced hair and skin rendering, subsurface scattering. So again, similarly, they mainly used the frame debugger to investigate rendering bugs. And similarly, uh, the multi-threaded issues moving to DX11, bad ordering of sync points. Issues with using the wrong render targets in MSAA 
for example, using MSA color when the depth buffer isn't MSAA. So you can imagine how that would, that would look. They use it to debug stencil issues for skin and hair rendering, a couple of crossfire related issues, and more specifically to locate where shaders were used in the frame. So I want to talk a little bit about the client server model, um, because if you're into scripting, then this, this can you know, help you a lot. The client and server exchange data through a web server, as I mentioned. And if you look at the console output from the Perth Studio server, you can see these commands here. So 5344 is the process ID. We're looking at DX11 server, the frame debugger, pipeline, pixel shader, texture two thumbnail is the command to get a thumbnail back from the server. You can view all these commands in the server log. If you go to the help, pull down, click on server log. And what's good about this is that it contains error messages generated by the server as well. So if you've got the runtime, um, DX runtime, uh, debug runtime on, those errors will appear in here too. And the log displays the commands sent from the client to the server. So if you want to know how to get the code viewer, you use that command. So um, this is a you know, screenshot of Far Cry running with Perth Studio 2. What you do is connect your client, check out the um, requests in the console or in, in the log, open up a browser, type the URL in here. So here you can see localhost, process ID, and the string that you see down here. And it just pulls a thumbnail image back and you can view it in, in the browser. In fact, the first client that we developed for Perth Studio 2 was a, a browser, JavaScript browser, and the .NET client that we currently use you know, came about a year afterwards. So you can get every bit of data that you need to reconstruct a, a draw call or a frame using that. Um, here you can see we've got the render states. They come back in an XML tagged form. And this is actually the data that our client uses to display as well. You can get the shader code. In fact, you can get every bit, as I say, of data that you need to generate the frame or the draw call. In fact, we have a tool internally that will take this compiler C++ app that will just render a draw call over and over again. So what we wanted to do in Far Cry 3, as I mentioned, was locate a very specific piece of HLSL code um, and identify which draw calls in the frame it was being used. So we were able to uh, write a script to do that, and I'll show that running now. Um, so we've got a loop. We send a command to request the HLSL code. HLSL code restored using a unique hash as a key. And then you advance the breakpoint and continue around the loop. So actually, let's just show that. Hopefully the demo is running. Back, here we go. So I just connected to the game again, took a frame capture. So what I have down here is my script. We're going to start at draw call one and go to draw call 100. And uh, this is the, uh, the code that we're going to execute. We've got a little batch file. I'll double click on that. And here you can see the hash is being generated. And in this render target, you'll see the next draw call being applied. So we went there for a couple hundred frames, extracting the shader code, generating a hash, and we can see we've got 11 unique 
pixel shade as used in this frame. It was used slightly different in Far Cry because we what we did was we searched the, the shader code for the strings that we were looking for, but then we had a list of all the draw calls where that shader code was being used. So I think you can agree it's a fairly powerful tool for data mining your application, so you can search for pretty much anything. If you're looking for a particular render state, you could use a script to locate that. So what I'm doing now is I just search the API trace for the sky sequence, sky rendering. I'm just going to move back to the frame debugger. There we go. And this is the uh, draw call where we're rendering the, uh, the sky here. What I want to show is the shader debugger. So the shader debugger allows us to um, debug all of the threads in flight, all of the pixels in flight um, simultaneously. At the top here we have a draw mask and the pixels in white are all the pixels that have been executed uh, in the last instruction. And below here we've a register buffer view and we're looking at the most recent register R0 and we can see the values, um, the color values there. And here we are um, with our breakpoint in the shader code. I can put a breakpoint after the sample and run to it. And here we can see register value R0. I can take the uh, zoom to fit off and I can actually go in and inspect these individual register values. You can see the X and Y location change down here and we can see the individual values um, for the registers at that location. I can also mouse over the values in the code all the registers in the code and see the values of them. So as you can imagine, you can step through the code and compare your output, your visual output, to what you think your shader code might be doing and uh, make any changes, recompile, put it back in and run it again. So a little bit about the shader debugger there. Okay, I'm going to shut that down. So Valve used the tool um, extensively in porting Source 2 to OpenGL. And uh, here's an overview of the process they went, they went through. Um, they started by porting uh, to OpenGL on Windows first. So they got a translation layer. Uh, that would convert the, the, uh, the DX commands to, to GL. And then they used SDL to abstract away the windowing input APIs. And this resulted in one build that they could compile and run on Windows, DirectX 9, and OpenGL, and Linux, OpenGL, and OS X. This allowed them to use several key Windows-based OpenGL tools, such as Perth Studio and Code Excel. So Perth Studio 2 doesn't yet have a GL backend. In fact, we, we kind of do, we're just working on it, it's not finished. But when Valve uh, were doing this port, we didn't have that available, but Perth Studio was the tool they wanted to use. They really liked the functionality of it. So they worked around the issue. And what they found was that the majority of OpenGL rendering bugs found on Linux could be reproduced on, on Windows. It's essentially a similar driver. So therefore, most of their debugging work uh, could be done under Windows. Plus, you've got the added advantage of the nice um, suite of tools that are available under Windows. They don't have to move all of their tools onto Linux and try and debug there. Just simply bring the data to, to the Windows environment. And in fact, they used API trace from GitHub um, to record traces and then play them back, uh, record traces on Linux bring those trace files over to the PC uh, on Windows, play them back in a player that they wrote, or extended rather, captured that in Perf Studio, and got the data back that way. So they're very dedicated to their tooling infrastructure, um, spent a lot of uh, you know, time 
an investment in that. Why use Per Studio? So they found that they had a number of glitches in Left 4 Dead 2 and Team Fortress 2 in OpenGL mode. And most of these bugs were introduced by themselves in their translation layer or in their learning uh, as they converted from DX to OpenGL. And what they found was that Per Studio was the only uh, available GL debugger that could work with a large GL application. All, all others at the time simply fell over. But more importantly, it was also a great way to learn OpenGL. So these guys were actually learning OpenGL as they were converting on the fly. So there's some things about the tool that they found pretty valuable. They started with the API trace window. So the frame debugger window wasn't as useful for them. They started with the API trace window. One of the things they really liked was the being able to see the interface or the OpenGL version of the call. So you could go off and research that, see how it should really be used. The API trace view is synchronized with the frame debugger. If you click uh, on a call in the API trace view, the frame debugger will jump to that draw call as well. So you've got a triangulation of the data. They can find out what's going on at that API call. Here they're rendering the gun, etc. And the API trace can be saved to CSV files. One of their favorite techniques was to get a, a CSV or a trace file for um, a frame that was working and then one that wasn't literally going through. Uh, using Beyond Compare to highlight the differences in the API usage and find out where their translation from DX to GL was not working right or gave them the wrong result. So um, their usage of the tool, very, very different to how we expected. Yeah, the frame debugger saved their bacon, which I kind of like that. So it was their quote. I thought I'd better use it. They like the fact that you can scrub through the GL draw calls and get a feel for how the frame builds up. We actually did a hack so that we could support um, perf markers, even though it's a GL app. So they would load the uh, D3, D9, uh, DLL, and uh, get the uh, pointers to those functions and get those working in the, in the game. They like the fact that you could hand edit the GLSL shaders and reinsert them back into the game. And they use this to debug their shaders um, quite a lot. So they would hack the shader to fetch from a single texture or an explicit LOD. GL obviously is very state dependent. They like the uh, the state visual uh, the state uh, viewer, but most of their work was done through uh, scrubbing through the, uh, the the various draw calls. Oh yeah, the other interesting thing, uh, going back to using multiple tools, they use PIX and GPS2 at the same time um, and would compare traces on those. So again, um, use as many tools as you can. They've got a few uh, troubleshooting tips that they came up with. You can download the slides later and go through those. Uh, one thing we didn't expect, on their own, uh, they went off and found Code XL and used GDebugger which is a component in uh, Code XL, and it has a really good trace startup facility, so you can see um, all of your common OpenGL state um, rendering-related problems. GDebugger reports those as your as your game is starting up, so that's another useful tool um, if you're interested in that. So they're very dedicated to their tooling infrastructure, um, and still are. We're still involved with them um, as it's an ongoing product. Um, I was going to do a demonstration of Left 4 Dead 2, but we're running a little short on time, so I'm actually going to skip that. What's next for Per Studio 2? Okay, currently, the latest version is 2.14, and we've just put in hardware counter support for uh, Hawaii GPUs. And that is available on the GPU Perf API library to download if you're interested in building your own um, counter based tools. We've had to build in more support for multi-threaded applications. We've added pipeline-specific counters for OpenGL and support for OpenGL compute. As I mentioned, uh, the Linux OpenGL uh, backend is in development, as are uh, Mantle tools. We're targeting Ubuntu 12.04 and just that at the moment for various reasons. Um, in this scenario, you run Per Studio 2 in the game 
uh, on your Linux box. Here you can see a screenshot of a Super Tux cart from SourceForge. And you'd actually run the client on a Windows box and connect over the network. Here you can see an API trace. We've got the profiler working and the frame debugger. So what we're doing now is you know, bringing up the tool on bigger and bigger applications. And hopefully we'll have this running on Steam apps within a, a few days. Excuse me. So Mantle, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about that at the, this conference. It's a new graphics API from AMD. And there are other presentations better suited to finding out more about that than this one. But it's an API that's designed for GPU efficiency, unlocks the new performance features of our GCN hardware, and solves the small batch issue. And if you get the chance, um, Dan, your talk is tomorrow, is it? Yeah. Get to uh, Dan's Oxide uh, talk about Mantle tomorrow, um, where hopefully he'll be showing the, the demo. This is a screenshot that they provided to us. Thanks, Dan. You can't really get an idea from the screenshot of the number of objects that um, are actually flying around in, in the demo from this, but uh, it's well worth getting to see if you can see that tomorrow. So our tools are currently in development. They're fairly embryonic at the moment because Mantle is a, is a new API and has a slightly different usage model and poses some you know, unique and new challenges to uh, the tooling of that API. But we can see here an API trace of uh, Star Swarm. Uh, we can see the multi-threaded nature. And we can tell by some of the timing values that this is all happening incredibly fast in there. So expect more in 2014 on Mantle tools. So here's a little summary of why we think Per Studio is uh, particularly useful. And with that, we've got a few minutes left for questions. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Guy in yellow. Not right at the moment. Um, we do have a list to put them in. Okay. Yeah. So that'll be one of the first things we do uh, in the early next year. Good question. Anything? Yep. Keep going. Yeah, pixel history. We don't support that at the moment. We've had a lot of requests for it. Uh, that they kind of tapered off, and we didn't get around to putting that in yet. It's still on the list of features, but it's kind of falling a little bit by the wayside. Um, still a useful feature? Yeah. Yeah, yeah OK. Thanks. Anything else, guys? Uh, Keep going. <laughs> What we do is uh, we, we have a pink outline that indicates the area that uh, is being uh, rendered by that draw call. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Enjoy the conference. Appreciate it. Bye.